Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Friday, September 4th, 2020, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, well, after months and months and months, I'm finally getting to the second half of my series looking into the quote-unquote giants or large hominids, as I like to call them. And the first half of the series here concentrated on the United States, and I went through the United States state by state, and we went over the accounts of the giants there, major newspapers, uh, academic research papers, town histories, county histories, um, you know, state histories. We've gone through all of that. And, you know, often again, I mean, besides being just absolutely fascinating, and you, if you haven't seen it, I put it into a playlist on my channel, so you can just go there. If you just want to look at your own state and not look so much as other stuff, that's fine. Just take a look at it, man, because whatever state you're from, there's something there to talk about. And um, I think, um, you know, the revelations that we come to from looking at these things is that there's a whole era of giants in the past of all different sort of varieties as well as you know people and hominids of all types that we can only imagine so let's take a look at the giants international now in the second half of the series i'm going to go to canada that's our closest neighbor here and of course as i suspected you could find just some amazing stuff um, from the accounts in canada and again to all the people who are sort of skeptical and whatnot i mean Many of these accounts, as we find out, were um, reviewed by professional academics. And we're going to go over just a, a lot of the skeptical points that are made about these things that are just unfounded and are not well grounded in any sort of logic. And um, we'll talk about that because I have an article, actually, that I'm going to single out from these um, Canadian accounts here that sort of explains it in a way that uh, I'd like people to sort of consider things. But let's go to these accounts in Canada because they are absolutely fascinating and I think they are just absolutely worth talking about here. So let's take a look at them. 207 to 9 foot tall skeletons, Cayuga, Canada. So, we frequently hear the discovery of the skeletons of a gigantic race, and we are therefore the more puzzled to know to what race the mound builders belonged. For although we are called a new country, comparatively speaking, we may be the oldest. Isn't that interesting that they think this? Okay, isn't Europe and everywhere else on earth the oldest? Well, I have a tendency to agree with this fellow. I think it's the oldest. It's not the new world, folks. It's the old world. Forget about all that stuff. They're pumping your head full of junk and making it into mush. And now you can't think about things properly because everything is backwards and opposite. Okay? Like bizarro world. A few years ago, an article appeared in the Toronto Telegraph stating that in the township of Cayuga in the Grand River on the farm of Daniel Fredenberg, five or six below the surface, five or six feet below the surface, were found 200 skeletons nearly perfect in a string of, in a string of beads around the neck of each stone pipes in the jaws of several of them and many stone axes and skinners scattered around in the dirt. The skeletons were gigantic, some of them measuring nine feet, and few of them less than seven. Some of the thigh bones were six inches longer than, than any now known. The farm had been cultivated a century and was originally covered with a growth of pine. There was evidence from the crushed bones that, that a battle had been fought, and these were some of the slain. Were these the remains of Indians or some other race? Who filled this ghastly pit? Oh, probably the people who executed the giants. Us. Or, you know, the native peoples there. Just, you know, another branch of Homo sapiens. So, that's the Pioneer Society of Michigan, uh, 1915, I guess. And 
Headlines, a remarkable sight, 200 skeletons of Anakin in Cayuga Township, a singular discovery by <clears throat> Tarantonian and others. A vast Golgotha open to view, some remains of the giants that were in those days. From our own correspondence, Cayuga, August 21st, 1880 map of Cayuga Township, South Haldeman County, Ontario, Canada. Old map there. The cardinal points there. On Wednesday last, Reverend Nathaniel Wardle, Mrs. Messrs. Oren Wardle of Toronto and Daniel Fredenberg were digging on the farm of the latter gentleman, which is on the banks of the Grand River in the township of Cayuga. When they got to five or six feet below the surface, a strange sight met them. Piled in layers, one upon, <clears throat> upon top of the other, some 200 skeletons of human beings, nearly perfect, around the neck of each one being a string of beads. There were also deposited in this pit a number of axes and skimmers made of stone. In the jaws of several of the skeletons were large stone pipes, one of which mis Mr. O. Wardle took with him to Toronto a day or two after this Golgotha was unearthed. These skeletons are those of men of gigantic stature, some of them measuring nine feet, very few of them being less than seven feet. Some of the thigh bones were found to be at least a foot longer than those at, at present known, and one of the skulls being examined completely covered the head of an ordinary person. These skeletons are supposed to belong to those of a race of people anterior to the Indians. Some three years ago, the bones of a mastodon were found embedded in the earth about six miles from this spot. The pit of its ghastly occupants are now open to the view of many, any who wish to make a visit there later in Dunville, August 22nd. There's not the slightest doubt that the remains of a lost city are on this farm. At various times within the past years, the remains of mud houses with their chimneys had been found, and there are dozens of pits of similar kind to, just, to that just unearthed, though much smaller. In the place which has been discovered before, though the fact has not been made public hitherto. The remains of a blacksmith shop, which I find very curious, blacksmithing going on, at, containing two tons of charcoal and various implements were turned up a few months ago. The farm, which consists of 150 acres, has been cultivated for nearly a century and was covered with a thick growth of pine, so that it must have been ages ago since the remains were deposited there. The skulls of the skeletons are of an enormous size and all manner of shapes, about half as large again as are now to be seen. Well, that seems, I don't know what they're saying there. Are they smaller or larger? The teeth is mo in most of them are still in almost perfect state of preservation, though they soon fall out when exposed to the air. It is supposed that there is gold or silver in large quantities to be found in the premises, as mineral rods have invariably, when tested, pointed to a certain spot and a few yards from where the last batch of skeletons was found directly under the apple tree. Some large shells, supposed to have been used for holding water, which were also found in a pit, were almost petrified. There is no doubt that there is a scheme of exploration carried on thoroughly. The result would be a scheme of exploration carried on thoroughly, the result would be highly interesting. A good deal of excitement exists in a neighborhood, and many visitors call at the farm daily. The skulls and bones of the giants are fast disappearing, being taken away by curiosity hunters. It is the intention of Mr. Fredenberg to cover the pit up very soon. The pit is ghastly and extreme. The farm is skirted on the north by the Grand River. The pit is close to the banks, but marks are there to show where the gold or silver treasure is supposed to be under. From the appearance of the skulls, it would seem that their possessors died a violent death, as many of them were broken and dented. Okay, which suggests to me that it wasn't to people of shorter stature that killed these people. It probably was other people of similar stature. 
okay? So right away, people can say, it's a war, Indian, you know, war of the giants. Well, maybe not, okay? We're talking about 200 people. This may be an insurrection or something within, you know, the uh, society of the Gardena and the Hopewell, okay? So, whereas, you know, you have this political hierarchy there, I'm sure, in some sort of confederation, which I'm also sure of, okay, based on our knowledge of contemporary Native Americans, okay, so look, you know, this could certainly be some sort of insurrection or some, maybe some outside attack or something like that, but Certainly, it probably was not anybody like Homo sapiens with these wounds in their heads from war clubs, because that would be indicate somebody of a similar stature. So possibly an insurrection, in my mind, in a civilization so vast and large, covered so much territory, these these internal struggles going on. <sighs> The, the axes are shaped like tomahawks, small but keen instruments. The beads are all of stone and of all sizes and shape. The pipes are not unlike in the shape the cutty pipe, and several of them are engraved with dogs' heads. They have not lost their virtue for smoking. Some people profess to believe that the locality of Fredenberg Farm was formerly an Indian burial place, but the enormous stature of the skeleton is in fact that pine trees of centuries growth covered this spot goes far to disprove this idea. Ancient, source Ancient American, American, Volume 6, Issue 41, research and submitted by Benoit Crevier, originally published in a Daily Telegraph, Toronto, Ontario, Wednesday, August 23rd, 1871. Okay, so very interesting there. Mud huts, a, a smithy shop, um, all sorts of things on earth there, never to be seen or accounted for again, and, you know, just disappeared for some strange reason. Giant axe head from Manitoba. Giant tools and artifacts too large for normal sized people. Giant axe head, 16 inches long, weight 27 and a half pounds. Okay, normal size stone axe head, six inches long, weight five pounds. Okay, so even a five pound axe, okay, stone axe would be quite taxing on the average human being. Most axe heads don't weigh more than, you know, four pounds, five pounds. Okay, they have other types of axes, but the motion for swinging those is similar to that of a sledgehammer. Those are different kinds of axes. The type of ones that you swing vertically, like what they're suggesting here, would be extreme. In the extreme, even at 27 and a half pounds, even if it was some sort of ads or something like that, it still would be incredibly heavy for human beings. And again, they'll just, you know, mainstream archaeologists and anthropologists will say that these things were votive votive items as if the people intended that they were going to be of giant size into the afterlife everywhere they were going but no research cultural research by anthropologists has ever revealed that they thought this at all by any tribe in any of the americas anywhere okay this is their own made up stuff okay their own fantasy because they just can't believe it okay they've been trained and programmed to assume other things okay all the stuff that you and i and everybody learned in school about these things and some stuff we didn't learn on purpose they name all british columbia skeleton found of super indian discovery of a large size indian bones of large size indian bones by victory gardeners at departure bay three miles north of here is believed to give support to the legend that a giant tribe inhabited vancouver island 300 years ago the lower jaw part of a skull and the shin bone of an indian were, were unearthed and preliminary examination suggests that their owner may have been around seven feet tall weighed more than 400 pounds and was between 70 and 80 years old when he died it is believed he may have died in battle as the legend persist that a giant tribe exterminated the Nanaimo Indians 300 years ago at Departure Bay. Get that, okay? <clears throat> a giant tribe exterminated the Nanaimo Indians, okay? Bones found were covered with small rocks three feet under the surface. Okay, so 
very interesting there. This humanoid or whatever it was weighed 400 pounds, they estimate. It was between 70 and 80 years old, so awfully old when he died, okay? And, you know, of course, the, you know, again, it would, you would have to examine the uh, wounds to these skeletons to, uh, you know, figure out who was killing them and whatnot, but it could very well be, again, a part of insurrection or whatever, you know. All right. Giant human skull, breastplate, and shield. This one is fascinating to me, I think, anyway, but just listen to it, and it's so very interesting. Dr. McHenry of Quebec, who spent the last summer in Labrador, writes to the Archaeological Weekly that he found many important evidences of the presence of Northmen, whoever the Northmen were, in that peninsula on the banks of the River Moise and in the regions frequented by the Metagnes and the Nascope Indians. One cairn in particular, the stones of which were so heavy as to defy the assaults of Indians or bears, he forced open with gunpowder and found it it, it found in it a giant human skull, breastplate, and brass-bound shield. The breastplate, though much rusted, bore signs of an inscription or legend. Failing to decipher which, he sent it to Copenhagen, Copenhagen to see if it could be made out by the American archaeologists there. Yeah, yeah, they made it out all right, shipped it right back to the Smithsonian where they you know, got rid of it somewhere, but isn't that interesting, a breastplate and a brass bound shield, a gigantic human skull in a stone construction there that they had to, they couldn't lift by hand or anything like that, or had to make some sort of contraption to get it apart, but they didn't do that, they just used dynamite to blow it apart, okay, giant stones placed there by somebody, okay, probably not an average size person, Stark County Democrat, 14th May, 1874, chronicling America. McGill Gillibray, seven feet, four and a half, petrified giant. Again, another interesting thing, and we've seen and heard about all these petrified giants in the Americas, and my question is, without able, being able to examine this thing, okay, what is it exactly? Is it truly a petrified human being? or hominid, large hominid, or giant, is it really one of these things? Um, or is it a statue from some lost civilization from just so long ago, and they can't believe it has the features of a human being or whatever, and it leads them to believe it's another petrified man or something like that, although I read you about this human fulgurite that they found in Pennsylvania, okay? You know, petrification evidently takes place in different means than we actually think. It doesn't take millions of years. It could happen very quickly. So, is this a statue from some lost civilization? Are all these petrified remains, what they claim to be petrified remains, so just like statues of some civilization that was totally destroyed here in the Americas, where it seems to be many more accounts of the giants than anywhere else in the world? I don't know. I'm just throwing out these questions here and seeing what comes back. Uh, Toronto, Ontario, March 25th. Mr. George Simpson of McGill and Murray recently made a remarkable discovery. While digging on his farm, he struck on a large stone and after clearing the dirt away, discovered a petrified man. The figure measured seven feet, four and a half inches in height and was almost perfect in form. Parts of the body were white, and the rest was of dark grayish color. It is one of the greatest curiosities ever seen in this country. It's reported by the New York Times, 1884. Okay, so was this indeed a petrified um, creature, a petrified humanoid, large hominid? Was it a petrified, or was this a, simply a statue that was created during that time in that culture, and again, was, you know, part of the um, geology there in the strata. I don't know, but, you know, it's, I often think that what they're actually finding is statues from some lost civilization, unless what's left of these statues, you know, they may have sustained quite a bit of damage 
you know, before being buried underground or whatever. So I just ponder that question from time to time. Ellensburg Human Giant, Canada's race of giants. Bones of human giant have been discovered at Ellensburg, Northwest Canada. The size of the thigh and other bones indicated a man at least eight feet high, and from his massive structure, he must have weighed over 20 stone. The skull is, mo is most remarkable, the Express says, its massive size and enormous brain space marking it out from other prehistoric skulls. While the forehead slopes down somewhat, Mr. L. Y. Sharp, chief of the survey department, says, the width between the ears and the deep, well-rounded space at the back of the head are convincing testimony of high High intelligence for a primitive man. The head has no resemblance to the Indian skull, and I am convinced that this skull is of the prehistoric race of people who inhabited this part of America sometime prior to the Indian control. Okay, so it's from the Hawera Norm Norman B. Star, 30 November 1912, 20th century. So, again, you know, the they're often saying that these people were of high intelligence. You know, the ruling class, the Edina with their vaulted craniums, the largest in the world, not elongated skulls, but vaulted cranium, okay, supposedly, and may have been some of the most intelligent people in the world, okay? But size has nothing to do with it, it's structure. Vancouver's gigantic savage skull given in museum. Archaeologists present Indian relic, in, relic to Smithsonian, and what a mistake that was. They don't, just didn't know it back then because they were fooled like so many other people today. Skull given museum. Archaeologists present Indian museum. Uh, Moza Flathead Chief. Captain Chittenden of Santa Barbara, California, the donor invaded savages burial ground at night at risk of life has refused tempting offers for curio in the last 20 years. Captain Newton H. Chittenden of S Santa Barbara, California yesterday presented to the Smithsonian Institution the skull of an aboriginal giant which he found on the southern shore of Vancouver Island, British Columbia about 20 years ago. The specimen, which is that of a flathead Indian, Okay, you're saying a flathead Indian. Okay, because the flathead Indian skulls seem to resemble this thing. They're not practicing uh, cranial deformation. See? Okay, natural. Okay, pseudodolicocephalic skull. The specimen, which is that of a flathead Indian, was obtained by the owner at great personal risk, and he has long treasured it as a priceless possession. It has been the object of great interest among the many European anthropologists who have seen it, and many have offered great sums to tempt Captain Chittenden to part with it. But until yesterday, he persistently declined. A splendid specimen. When Captain Chittenden took his gift to the institution yesterday afternoon, it attracted much interest. An assistant, Fureda Herdlicka, that's his Alish Herdlicka, okay, the scumbag who buried all the accounts and research on the Giants, even, you know, well-respected um, academics who researched these things. He's the ass from the Smithsonian who set back this, you know, just, you know, uh, archaeology in general, some 20, 30, 40 years. He set it back 100 years when it comes to looking at these accounts of the giants and, and helped dispel the whole idea of giants whatsoever and um, part of the um, controlled opposition as well. He's a gatekeeper. He's the gatekeeper at the Smithsonian from the past. It was the custom of the Flathead Indians to bind the heads of the babies of the tribe between two boards for a period of 100 days following a birth. But see, this is the whole thing. The Flathead Indians were never known to do this while you know, in the known histories of them, when whites finally contacted them, 
okay? They weren't doing that at the time, but they were supposedly known for doing this, okay? Just, they make stuff up, all right? As a result, the skulls of the tribe were flattened in front and back. The flat head was the standard of beauty in the tribe. The greater the depression of the cranium, the more handsome the possessor was their belief. The flat heads inhabited the Columbia River Valley and portions of Vancouver Island. Gave up law practice. I don't want to read about him giving up this law practice, but, you know, he found this thing here, and it's just... The giant skull was donated to the Smithsonian Institution and here, um, you know, uh, the moderator of the site is showing uh, Agent Smith here. So, that's it. The Washington Post, 1920. <coughs> giant and ancient mass. So, again, from the 20th century. So, Look, guys, it seems to me that, you know, you can see from these remarkable accounts here that the giants were, you know, proliferated through all of Canada as well. We covered Alaska, so it makes a lot of sense that their giant skeletal remains would be found in Canada. So, again, guys, it's, they're all over the world, okay? We're talking about a civilization and a worldwide society, the antediluvian society that had all these rather large and strange hominids in them and other hominids, you know, people, we were there, possibly human beings at least 200,000 years ago. But I have other theories about that we can talk about later on, again, because of corn, but if you want to know more about corn, you got to look at my videos on corn because that just says a lot in itself. But any case, guys, that's the end. That's the last article here that I want to read about the giants found in Canada. And you can see no less remarkable accounts here. Okay, some of them looked at by experts, as is usually the case in the past. But the skeptics and naysayers say that those people were just, you know, they were illiterate or, you know, they weren't uh, so, we weren't so advanced enough in the medical sciences for them to determine this. But I beg to differ with that. We're going to cover, I singled out another article from Canada here that you're going to want to hear about. We're going to do it. I'll do it in between whatever uh, country I probably do in Mexico next. So. We'll do Mexico, and then I'll do that, and we'll see what goes from there. That's all. We're going to go worldwide, every single country that at least has accounts that we know about. All right? Hope you found that fascinating. Please do hit the like button, and Bugcat7 signing off. A peace.